So thank you for coming and, and thank you for having me. Um, one of the things for you to prepare for this afternoon is, is that I will be requiring you to do some work and, and so you need to think of a partner or two that you would like to work with this afternoon. So no more, as I say to students, no more than three because groups larger than three people, somebody gets left out. So two or three people per work group, please. So um, to give you a bit of an outline of what I'm planning on doing this afternoon, first of all, I'm going to try and speak as little as possible to begin with. I do have a little bit of presentation to give, which includes the purpose of this tool that I've, that I've designed, um, the intended outcomes associated with it, and objectives. Um, I'm going to try and define some terms and definitions, including a sort of mini crash course in stand dynamics, so that perhaps while we're working through the tool, we get bogged down as little as possible in, in differences of interpretation of terminology. Um, uh, my grandmother always told me that my problem is my first language should have been Welsh, not English. Um, but English sucks. And forestry English is horrid because we use all kinds of terms to mean all kinds of different things. Very confusing for students, as they can probably speak to the soul. Try to, well, try to think this way. And then what I'm hoping to fill the majority of the afternoon is an actual working session where I'm going to give you some example stands, some actual data to work with, to work with the key, through the key and get some feedback on, on whether it actually works as intended. And please don't hesitate to stop me with questions or comments at any point. So, goals. Um, the C and C, as I'm calling, the uh, climate and carbon silvicultural keys that I've designed have been designed to produce two goals at the forest stand level. One is to maintain or enhance the climate change resilience of a forest stand. The other is to maximize the carbon storage of an actively managed forest. So the key point here is that I, I was tasked with both goals associated with this tool. The climate change adaptation resilience is definitely plays a higher order of priority, priority in the way the tool is designed to work. But both of those goals are attempted to be equally addressed with this tool. Go ahead. Can the carbon storage be in the soil? Sure could. Certainly could. Um, it's not a parameter that's necessarily explicitly addressed by the tool. You'll see that, that a, a large body of the outcomes would seek to address that as well. But the tool is silvicultural in a classical sense, in the sense that the approach to the tool is either attempting to deliberately manipulate the, the structure and, and composition structure of the canopy, the, of, the, of the forest, of the trees, rather, sorry, not forest, the trees, and, and possibly site, sort of site level, sort of, sort of classical site preparation. Type I don't know if I answered your question. Good. Um, so, first, I have an exercise. I told you I was trying not to speak too much. I get, the more I talk, the more uncomfortable I get. So, part one, I want you, as an individual, to write down your definitions to silviculture, stand, silvicultural treatment, and silvicultural system. In a, in, a, in, a, in a minute, a couple minutes, what are your definitions for those terms? Silviculture, stand, silvicultural treatment, and silvicultural system. The second part of this exercise, I'd like you to find a partner or two, no more than one or two, and discuss your, your answers to those definitions. So, any questions or comments you want to share with the group with regards to those definitions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> People, when they discuss them with each other, are fairly consistent in their ideas of what those things mean? <laughs> no Welsh involved? No? Okay. My grandmother would be disappointed. So, um, this is the working definition of silviculture that I use in, in my classroom and working with students. Um, I'm used to looking up at the board, I wouldn't hear. So, 
The science and technology of establishing and maintaining forest stands that have value to people. So silviculture is forest management at the stand level. And effective silviculture relies on knowledge, both science and indigenous knowledge. And what I mean by indigenous knowledge here is, is in the broader classical sense, knowledge of the land. Right? I mean, a lot of the most successful subculture that has ever existed has existed in the absence of modern science, right, over millennia. And, and what I mean by indigenous is not necessarily uh, uh, property of indigenous or Aboriginal people in the sense that anybody that works long enough and pays attention long enough in a given locality can, de can develop indigenous knowledge. And then, of course, some culture is not a science, it's an applied science, so there's a fair amount of messy, muddy trial and error associated with it, most definitely. The stand, another definition, being a distinct patch of forest as the traditional or classical basic management unit of civil culture, and it is purely a concept. You know, the students, uh, certain types of students want me to specifically and absolutely define the boundaries of stands, but the reality is that we decide where the boundaries of stands lie based on um, not only the actual ecological context, but the managed objectives we're managing for. Right? David Smith was famous for saying that there actually is no such thing as an uneven age stand because every little mini cohort in an uneven age stand is a little mini stand doing its mini thing, right? So where we draw the lines around stands are really, it is a human construct, but we do draw lines around them in order to effectively manage them. Um, patches of forest get so big at a certain scale that operationally we can't manage them. Obviously we need to manage them strategically at the landscape level, but silviculture is about managing at the operational level. The level we walk around and can smell and taste and identify everything around. Would you not say though that there is some sort of homogeneity uh, at the ecological context level? There can be. Because if you, well, if you don't have that, you could, I guess, potentially you could kind of call it a stand. Sure you could, but I guess um, anybody who's taken a course in sort of photo interp and photograms, you'll recognize that there's two different people in the room, splitters and lumpers. <laughs> And the reality is, is that it's amazing the, the, the hairs that people split. And I'm a lumper, not a splitter. Like I tend to identify things that are obviously distinctly different. And if it's not different, I don't try to make it different. I mean, I'm, I'm, and that doesn't mean to suggest that there isn't diversity within that patch. But we do draw lines around, some, around things, right? And, and the more sophisticated our ability to classify site becomes, the more lines we can draw even between patches that seem homogenous, right? I mean, there are parts of the Maritimes, for example, where the pear material is poor and there's like contiguous tracts of black spruce dominated forest ranging from bogs to, to swamps to moist sites to dry sand esters, right? Is that all the same stand? Completely different ecosites dominated by black spruce. Anybody else? Cool. Definition of silvicultural treatment or intervention is some of the other language that people use. Um, a specific action, meaning something done to a stand intended to manipulate the stand composition, structure, and dynamics of the stand. Classically, this means one of two things, either to manipulate the composition and structure of the vegetation, for example, cutting things, killing trees, killing plants, um, or to manipulate the actual site characters through some form of Mechanical, mechanical site preparation, for example. That's just two examples of uh, sort of two groupings of uh, treatments. So specific, uh, treatment is a specific action. As opposed to a civil cultural system, which is a complete plan for the maintenance of a stand, of stand composition and structure in the long term into the next generation of trees and perhaps into the owner. Classically, in the Germanic tradition, and anybody in English-speaking language who studied forestry, including Scandinavia and Finland, have inherited a Germanic perspective on, on, on silviculture. Most of the, the premier forestry schools in, in the Western and Nordic world were founded by either German foresters or foresters that were trained in Germany. So classically, silvicultural systems are classified 
by the age structure they seek to maintain. So even age systems, two age systems, uneven age systems, and then what I like to call hippie silviculture, a regular system. And uh, it's a good fit for me. So climate and carbon storage peas, the objectives that I worked with were um, one, climate change resilience and adaptation objective, meaning to, ma to maintain or encourage tree species that are low risk. So again, this is a civil cultural tool. So there's a, there's a basic assumption for the most part of this tool that the stand is going to be actively managed and actively manipulated in some, in some outcome. So one of the basic premises of this tool is that it seeks to manipulate stands towards lower risk in terms of climate change. So uh, species being uh, defined as high risk as those that are ex expected to undergo a, a either A, a high degree of stress associated with climate change and or to be, as Anthony uh, described so well, to become under some situation of ecological context where they're no longer competitive, uh, no longer competitive to the site. What's that? Maladaptive was the word used. Thank you. Maladaptive, right? Um, so the, the keys are designed to encourage the, the, the practitioner to, to manipulate stance towards lower risk associated with climate change. So that basically the treatment outcomes are either to tend cohorts or trees and stands towards lower risk or to, rege or to, or to favor the regeneration of lower risk species. And depending on the age structures being maintained, perhaps both something. Cool. Low risk tree species. Um, the working definition I have is tree species that are predicted to be resilient and or adaptable to climate change. I went down a million different rabbit holes to design this, this even this current draft of this tool. Uh, it's probably one of the most difficult things I've ever worked on, um, many of which were um, an attempt to go through some sort of, I'm, I've been trained as a technologist to identify and classify and measure and, and assess and evaluate. That's how my brain is almost hardwired and I train people to do the same. So my initial attempts were to try to come up with a, almost like a forest inventory tool in the course of development. What I recognize is that A, I'm not an expert in climate change. B, what is a low risk species as a moving target? So for example, if you work in the Western Eco region in Nova Scotia, I'm sure balsam fir is a high risk species in terms of climate change. But if you work at 500 meters, 300 to 500 meters elevation in Northwestern New Brunswick, is balsam fir a high risk species right now? Certainly over the next 50 years or 100 years, right? So the reality is, is that what you rate as the hazard rating associated with climate change must depend on the ecological context in which you work. It requires a very robust and sophisticated ecological land classification system. Nova Scotia's, I must admit, is much further along than New Brunswick's is. New Brunswick's was excellent. We need to work on it. Um, and then it's also moving target, as Anthony so clearly projected this, this morning, right? So what's true now is not true necessarily in 50 years, is not true in 100 years. And what's true in Southern Ontario is not necessarily true in Southern New Brunswick. So. Derek, does your uh, um, key also lump in, say, forest pest species that may, that may be affected by climate change as well? No. Okay. No. And I've got a question that you're going you're gonna to have to try and answer related to that when you work for the key. Thank you. So, exercise two. First part, please write down three tree species that you would consider high risk in terms of climate change based on your own gut feeling or expertise or this, or this morning's presentation. So what you think are three high risk tree species and what you would consider as three low risk tree species. Anybody wanna share some high risk species that you identified, please? You think sugar maple is a high risk species? Anybody disagree with Julian? Where we live at, where we work at. Yeah. Ah, moving target. 
So you think sugar maple is high risk? Anybody disagree? I don't know if I don't know it's middle. Okay. <laughs> Jillian, why'd you pick sugar maple is high risk? Um, described to them just because it's, you know, specific to its environment. Uh, certain emissions, I believe. Interesting. Um, interesting point. Can you repeat what she said? It's hard to hear. Well, she's, what, what is speaking to is the fact that the interesting thing for a species like sugar maple in our climate is there actually is, a, again, I'm talking, I'm not talking about high elevation boreal sites in the Maritimes, but there is no climatic limitation to the range of sugar maple in the, in the Maritimes, right? So where we don't find it is site restrictions. restrictions. So it, it grows on our best sites. So what you're suggesting is that as such, it's sensitive to change? Yeah, and I'm thinking about the hardwoods and, um, like, for example, last year, like, we had a frost late into the year and it killed the buds. Um, I'm thinking like hardwoods are going to be sensitive to that because they have different growth stages throughout the year. Their buds and their leaves. Cool. Well, what Jillian's speaking about is, uh, when you mentioned specific examples that there was late, late frost that did a lot of damage to sugar maple early growth. Okay. So severe weather events in these. Yeah. Yep. That combined with moisture availability. So last year that, that happened was with us, which we did a commercial thing on a sugar maple stand and it was decimated by an insect pest, but it was precluded by a long drum period, which we didn't uh, accommodate for. When we were cutting trees, we saw there was barely any sap coming out of the trees at the time of the year, or characteristically, in that same site, we saw moisture coming out of them like, like crazy. So that severe long drum period weakened their defenses. It was basically like they, it, it had such a limited range in site characteristics that the moisture unavailability made them more susceptible. Right. Anybody been on a in the walk in the Maritimes with Ralph Nyland? Like, if you go for a walk in the woods with a northern hardwood silviculturalist from like like the heartland of like the best sugar maple sites in the world, they can't even figure out how sugar maple grows on sites in southern New Brunswick and, and Nova Scotia. Yeah. Like, for sugar maple forest to grow in a coarse textured soil, they're like, like, did I get trans? Like, did my did I get transport? to a different dimension. Like if they were to pick up that site and move it to the northern Great Lakes states, it'd be growing pine and oak. But remember that, you know, with Nova Scotia and Southern New Brunswick built in air conditioning and that eco zone with that constant humidity, right? Sugar maple grows on, a, on sites that it wouldn't do western. So what you're suggesting is that there's some, there's some risk associated with that at the site level. And there is risk associated with sugar maple as far as uh, pollution as well because right. it's very susceptible to acidic soils. Right. Right. It's just interesting that sugar maple came up because when we were talking, uh, both Rob and, and Nelson brought up sugar maple. Yeah. And, and for me, for the work that we've done, I've shown this morning, it's probably been one of the most difficult species to get a handle on. Right. And, and the modeling that can be done at the uh, it, it, it didn't do well, but the reason it didn't do well is it could be the beach all the time, right. which is probably quite a similar to the beach. Have you talked about the island? <laughs> 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 no, I haven't made that. But, uh, but I, I, have model model. I would say right now, in terms of not just my work, but others, that it's, I think it's one of the most uncertain. Right now. Like, fur seems to be a no brainer, also right. fur. Other ones like red maple seem to be, yeah, this one's going to, for sugar maple, uh, you get all sorts of mixed thoughts. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, even in the Maritimes, right, if you, if you work in western or northwestern Brunswick, the best sugar maple stands are on fine textured soils, particularly in the Valley Lowlands, right? Sites that are actually moist in Nova Scotia grow in spruce and fir because the moisture regime is higher in the summer and the rapid transportation rate, right, right? So it really does depend on where you are. Kim? The only other thing I want to mention is that risk, the concept of risk, is also relative not just to climate change, but to your management goals. Sure. Because if your management goal is to increase coarse woody debris, sure. it turns that concept of tent high risk of what you want that trees. Sure. Sure. Yep. Any other high risk pieces, sugar me? Jack Pine. Jack Pine. Anybody disagree? 
on Jack Marshall. Any other chances? We'll go White Birch. White Birch. Anybody disagree with White Birch? Kim disagrees or agrees with White Birch? I disagree. Disagree. What about uh, low risk species? What do people have for low risk species? Basswood. Basswood. Mm -hmm. Red oak. Red oak. That's a really good one. It makes you feel good. <laughs> feel really good. Yeah, until you go to Research Forest in West Virginia. Uh, Virginia State, and they tell you they've been trying to get rid of red maple for 60 years to grow red oak just to find people like red maple better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other lower species? Silver maple. Silver maple. Interesting. I have black cherry dying on my property. Okay. Look. What's it dying out, do you think? No, it gets up to about 15, 20 feet high. And well, I've got the black cherry. I'm at the northern limit of black cherry on my property on the southern slopes in the central uplands. But if you go even 10 miles down the road, there's no Where's your black property? Cherry. Stanley. But I'm on southern exposures in the upper Nashua. But if you go to southern New England or the Allegheny Plateau, like black cherry is there. I'm in Woodland. Unbelievable. Who's my main? No, Woodland up to Oh, you want to? Yeah, just not the same. Yeah, well, my black cherry looks like that too. Yeah. But I think there's probably a cl there's climate related there. I think we're right at the north of the black cherry. Yeah. Any other low risk species? Ironwood. Iron. Cool. White pine. White pine. There's white pine in, at high elevation in, in Mexico. Which is pretty cool. Like actual strobus. Huh. Huh. It's also I've never seen it. What's that? Thousand border lupin. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Massive range. Massive range. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I pointed out at the beginning, the, what I was tasked with was also to include carbon storage. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, and getting back to Tom's question, the primary focus I took with that is from a classical silviculture perspective of actual wood storage as opposed to soil so much. So based on the notion that carbon storage from a silvicultural perspective essentially amounts to maintaining a high density stand over the longest period of time possible. So the, the more density you store or a given period of time, the more carbon you're storing. So for example, um, people that are actually monetizing carbon projects at this point, my understanding is they're looking at 100 year Time horizons. Right. Come on. <laughs> Such as it complicates this further. So this is like on the stump in the woods. Right? Yep. So product mix, which also would have carbon implications. Yes, that's right. Water. That's right. Yep. Well, um, if you boil down the soil carbon, I mean, you right. come to the same thing. You want a high density stand yes. that isn't disturbed. So, right. You know. Right. Yep. In, a, in, a, in an ideal classical sense, which would really turn the likes of Ralph Nyland on and a bunch of Germanic obsessives, you know, the ideal, the normal belt with the perfect forest and a perfect theoretical context, the perfectly balanced uneven age stand that carried a high basal area would be a perfect carbon storage stand. Basically, permanent canopy cover, a balance of all ages, even equal growing space for all cohorts in the stand uh, in, per, in, you know, in perfection, the planter cohorts, right? Um, in reality, that's easier said than done, which I think um, anybody who's tried to even approach that would be able to recognize. And certainly the tool that I've designed definitely recognizes. So within the context of recognizing that there aren't very many stands on the landscape that would allow one to have a perfectly balanced running stand. At the very least, the key seeks to manage stands towards high densities for long rotations, right? Which is one of the reasons why none of the outcomes from the keys I've designed suggest short rotation, even a snow culture. There's a number of other reasons as well, but the primary one being that the carbon storage objective makes that, cancels out that, that option, right? 
because there's a, there's a lot of talk, realistic and reasonable talk, about if you're managing forests intensively for fiber production, that short rotation forestry is highly desirable because you can quickly adapt to changes in climate. But if we're talking about the combination of, of uh, climate change and adaptation resilience and carbon storage, uh, growing stance, even a stance for 35, 25, 35 years, 40 years, even 60 years, uh, doesn't store a lot of carbon. And then, I, and, and I get into this with students all the time. I mean, when we're talking about high density stance, it also depends on how we measure density. And anybody who's worked in practice, the most effective way to measure density operationally is by using Bayes Larry as an index of it. Um, so either a meat square pecker or a feet square pecker. So, before I give you some stuff to work on, I'm going to give you a little quick crash course in some of the terminology that's used in, in the keys. The first of which, the first number of which relates to disturbance dynamics, the stand dynamics. Um, so major disturbances being events that, that stimulate stands that are dominated by a single age group of trees, regardless of the biological age of trees. So for example, the, the keys speak of cohorts not age classes, but for, for, for a very uh, intentional reason. Um, although age class is the traditional Germanic term that we use, it's a, it's a, it can be a very confusing term in the sense that, that natural stands that are, or cohorts in stands originate from single events regardless of the age of the trees. So for example, in this picture, we have a regeneration layer and a stand that is established over decades in the top picture. I don't have the clicky pointing thing. But in the top picture, we have an, a regeneration layer that is developed in the shade of that stand, which in our climate, historical climate, is, a, is, is typical of stands as they age. Moisture is not traditionally historically a limiting factor to forest growth and tree growth. Our climate, shade tolerant species appear in the regeneration layer if you wait long enough without having to do anything to our stands. Um, and then there's been a major disturbance event in the second picture, which has allowed enough sunlight into the understory to initiate a new stand, right? But the biological age of those trees in that new stand could be all the map, right? And then we have record red spruce that sit for 150 years waiting for light. And then they grow along with five-year-old red spruce, and 50 years later, you would not be able to recognize necessarily the difference between either of those trees. Major disturbance versus minor disturbance. Disturbances that initiate cohorts in a stand, but do not initiate a new stand. And as David Smith would say, there is no such thing as a uneven age stand, because even that little mini hole kind of acts like a little mini stand in and of itself. Disturbance patterns, right? So in this example, it's an example of high severity disturbance where the majority of the overstory and the understory is destroyed by a disturbance. In our climate, the only natural event that mimics this is fire. And because moisture is not a limiting factor in our historical climate, fires historically in our part of the world were high severity, meaning that they were infrequent but the buildup of fuel and fire ladders, when they did occur, meant that the overstory and the understory were burned. Right. So this example, we have spruce fir pine forest. A fire occurs in the second picture. White uh, fire resistant white pine survive the fire, and then they seed down the burn. So that's an example of a high severity disturbance, being a major one, stand replace event, as opposed to this example, where we have another major disturbance event, but it is not high severity, which historically would have been more frequent in our last year, right? Not every 60 years, perhaps, but certainly more frequent than fires in the sense that at some point, perhaps an event would occur that would destroy some or all of the canopy, releasing its regeneration that was already established in the understory. So again, that is another example of a major disturbance event, but in this case, it's moderate severity, not high severity. Questions or comments? I have a question. So I recently read a, uh, a data that 
you know, 400 years ago or so, there, there could have been up to 8% of the land mass, which was covered by um, wetlands like beaver created wetlands. So, okay. um, so, you know, when you look at the role of water in terms of retaining carbon as well, does right. that factor into how you look at this silvicultural model mm -hmm. at all? Because essentially the beaver can act as a, so like a little silviculturalist. Absolutely. You know, doing very micro site disturbance uh, around their, their wetlands. So that would have impacts, obviously, but I realize it's not necessarily what exactly what you're looking at, but I'm just wondering how it interrelates with what you're looking at. It's not something I thought about when I was developing it, to be quite honest with you. That specific example. I do know talking to uh, foresters working in Pearl and in Northern Ontario, yeah. their 40 year plus buffer. Um, operational strategy in the boreal forest in Ontario is such that they see a decline in beaver habitat as a result. So on specific sites, they've, they're actually getting uh, alterations to permits to actually actively stimulate early successional hardwoods in stream and water forest buffers in boreal Ontario to try to curb beaver, yeah. for example. Right? So I mean, if, if, you, if you manage the all buffers to be spruce and fir, there's a little beaver out there. So, but I certainly didn't think of beaver specifically related to that, or as it relates to flooding of, of swamps. Of course, and then with a, with, a, with a beaver pond, when it's abandoned, you end up in a meadow, right. as opposed to a forest. Anybody else? As an alternate example, low severity minor disturbances, which occur within stands that don't replace entire stands. In this example, there's a sequence of events. Um, because they didn't draw any dead trees, it's clearly caused by either beavers or people, probably people. Mm -hmm. The dead bodies have been taken away. So for example, in that picture of three sequences, there's been some partial cutting or harvesting of some kind, um, stimulating new cohorts in the stand, producing a multi-age stand of some kind. So with that in mind, and I don't want to come back there's a weird reason. Um, the P speaks to single cohort dominated stands. So these are stands that have a canopy that is dominated by one age group. It does not mean all the trees are biologically the same age. It means they originated from a single man. Right? In this example, we have a sequence where regeneration develops in a partial overstory in the second picture. And then some sort of major event occurs. Let's assume a harvest and overstory removal. And we end up with a new regenerating stand following this event. But those trees in that final picture are not all the same age. They're the same cohort, but biologically, because they developed in the understory of the previous stand, they are not the same age. Right? So if you were to use some sort of narrow definition of age class structure and say, Anything that's not within 10 years of itself is in a different cohort. Nature doesn't work that way. These trees don't care what the age of their neighbors are. Right? So that single cohort stand comes from that single event, regardless of the age of the tree. It also speaks to the double cohort stands, which are the product, again, of major disturbance events, where canopy trees survive the disturbance, and you end up with a double cohort two-age stand, right? So again, even-age stands and two-age stands are both dominated by a single cohort. The difference in two-age or double cohort stands is that canopy trees actually survive the event of the nation. Questions or comments? As opposed to multi-cohort or uneven-age stands that are the product of continuous minor events. Truly uneven age stands, right, and, and balanced uneven age stands don't exist in nature. They're the construct of human beings. But uneven age stands do exist, right? And what they're a the product of is continuous, continuous disturbance events, which cause gaps in the stand, which recruit new cohorts, and you end up with an intimate mix of multiple cohorts in the stand. Over time. And the key does or doesn't apply to that? Yes, yeah. Uneven extent. 
So the other thing that the keys speak to are all over in Larson's development stages um, in the classic Stand Dynamics book, okay. which the, the part of the reason we're putting this up there is that people in different jurisdictions may use different terminology to describe these development stages and stands. The first development stage being stand initiation. I don't know if we can read that on, on the chart, but on the far left of that, of that diagram, a stand initiation stage is, a, is, a, is an initiating development stage following a major disturbance event where there is now light and available growing space for a generation to release. Stem exclusion being the second stage in that sequence occurs and begins when the trees actually form a closed canopy, right? And trees start organizing themselves into different crown classes, into different canopy layers. Um, and um, generally during stem exclusion, there's no space in the canopy for new recruitment. So mortality in the stem exclusion stage is primarily driven by, by differences in shade tolerance, competitive advantage, whatever else, right? So in general, dominant trees grow faster, suppressed trees grow slower, and eventually die. If you have mixed stands, it can be very complex because, for example, in our part of the world, you might have white birch mixed with balsam fir and red maple, and the white birch might actually initially dominate because of its rapid growth in shade and tolerance, but then would eventually die back and be replaced by a spruce and fir and hemlock or sugar maple or in a beach during the stem exclusion stage. Understory reinitiation being, as they say, in the, and when I worked in Washington State, they called it the transition stage. Some people refer to it as the transition stage because understory reinitiation is the transition between the dominance of a single age group towards a very old, multi-aged forest condition. What starts to occur as stem exclusion stands get aged is that canopy gaps, true canopy gaps, start to form in that stand, allowing recruitment or ingrowth of understory trees into the canopy. So over time, the stand becomes more and more multi-aged. Again, this development sequence assumes the absence of another major disturbance event. If we had a major disturbance event at any point along the sequence, we would go back to the stand right. So for example, if you had a balsam fir stand in the Cape Breton Highlands on an exposed site, the chances that it's ever going to make it to an old growth, multi-age, gap-driven development stage are very unlikely. But I've been in true gap-driven, multi-aged, old balsam fir forests on the North Peninsula of Newfoundland, where there are 300-year-old balsam fir trees and everything else in between, and enough deadwood to require like climbing to get through the through the understory. Okay. So. Balsam fir are capable of growing, the balsam fir forest is capable of growing into that stage. The final stage in Oliver and Larson's development stage sequence is the term old growth as a development stage. I wish they hadn't used that term because the unfortunate part is the term old growth means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Welcome to the English language. Other language used for that development stage has been things like the big gap driven phase or the shifting mosaic, which is Mormon and Lichen. Sort of the steady state phase, like there's all kinds of words for it. But eventually, a stand that originated from a, a single cohort, if left long enough, will develop this old, multi-aged jungle of sorts. Okay? Questions or comments? So, so when I'm talking about overall stage, not the key specifically speaks to it for that reason. But if I were to talk about the overall stage, I'm talking about a development stage, not a specific definition of what um, Succession in the key? Is there a hierarchy in those development stages in, in, in reference to the CNC? Like one of them produces more, is more resilient or has no. more climate change or no. storage capacity no. than another one? No, certain types of stands on certain kinds of sites become more and more susceptible to major disturbance events as they get older. There's no question about it. Certain types of stands on certain kinds of sites are capable of going into those very old development stages. But it's very important to recognize that, that, if, that if a stand reaches that stage of development, it's not a product of intervention, it's a product of stand development. I'm not suggesting that in 
a, a multi-age shifting gap full force is the same thing as a managed uneven age stand. The two are very different. Um, quickly before we move on, uh, successional patterns, right? So in these two diagrams, they're both examples of initial floristics. Um, the one on the left being the tolerance model, the one on the right being the parallel model. So contrary to Clementian succession, particularly in our part of the world, um, the reality is, is that high severity major disturbance events are actually naturally highly infrequent in our historical climate. It depends on the site you're on. But mid, mid successional and late successional species typically survive major disturbance events, either in the regeneration layer that developed underneath the old stand or in the presence of sea trees that survive the event. So in the sequence on the left, we have early successional hardwoods, which we all love to either love or love to hate, depending on what we're managing for and some form of later succession of species. In the example on the left, in order for those later successional species to survive, they must be shaped, right? The tolerance or inhibition model. On the right, we have another successional pathway called the parallel model, which recognizes that a lot of mid successional species, like white pine, like red oak, actually need to make it into a competitive crown position in the canopy because they're not shade tolerant. Otherwise, they get the crap kicked out of them and they'll lose them, right? So it's important to recognize the species you're working with in those patterns. And close out. The keys speak to different types of subculture systems. So the keys are not only designed to arrive at a treatment, but also First and foremost, a suggested subcultural system towards managing a stand, right, with the, game, with the aims of climate change resilience and So, one being classical even age systems, which are designed to create and maintain and reproduce even age stands, stands that are exclusively dominated by a single cohort, versus two age stands that are also designed to reproduce stands dominated by a single cohort, but unlike even age systems, two age systems retain canopy trees into the next rotation. So that you have a dominant cohort with older trees. Versus uneven age subculture systems, which deliberately attempt to maintain an intimate mix of multiple cohorts, multiple age groups, through continuous minor disturbances, some form of partial cutting of some kind, you know, the classical language selection cutting, selection systems, um, to produce and maintain truly uneven age stands through that continuous disturbance. And then finally, hippie silviculture. Um, the reality is that whether we would like it or not, many of the desirable species we're trying to manage do not have continuous regeneration patterns, whether we want them to have them or not. That is just the truth, right? So one of the problems with this picture is that you need to get continuous desirable regeneration for it to work. And if you don't, it fails. And we failed at it over and over and over and over again. If you want to go for a drive and mix wood, hodgepodge, rotten fir, red maple, I can take for a drive with Cater Research for us where they did single tree selection on every mixed wood site for 60 years and grew rotten fir and red maple from, from old stands of spruce, pine, fir, red maple, mixed wood. So, what? Which one? The rotten fir, the fir, rotten fir, red maple hodgepodge? Yeah, probably. We've got lots of examples of it. So the point I'm making is just because you're doing selection cutting doesn't mean you're actually effectively managing an uneven age stand. This requires continuous recruitment of desirable growing stuff. The reality is that often when uneven age systems won't work, some form of hippie silviculture will, right? There's some German dude who tried to make this illegal in Germany in the 18th century, so it was hard to take some dude. Um, the concept being that you wait until 
the combination of markets and generation conditions are ideal for regeneration. And then you gradually regenerate the stand as you see fit over extended periods of time. And then eventually you manage the next stand. So during the regeneration period or to a logger and a regular shelf wood might feel a lot like selection cutting because it's partial cutting and this and that, messing around, gotta protect all this crap, too expensive, whatever else. But at the end of sequence six, you actually have a new stand that you actually manage and you ignore the fact that it was regular and it's got different age trees and whatever else. And in a regular system, there is no attempt to manage multiple cohorts in the stand. At the end of the regeneration period, however long it takes, which could be decades, you end up with this gifty stand that you just let grow and manage it into the next rotation. So unlike uneven age culture, it doesn't depend on this constant maintenance and constant energy. It's actually a very different approach to this. Very different. 